Welcome to the Travel Leader Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Vandenberg. On our show, I interview and connect with leaders across travel, hospitality, and tourism. We talk leadership in our industry, what has shaped them, the successes, failures, and everything in between. Today, I'm speaking with Paul Rodnan, Director of Digital Marketing and Sales for Migas Hotel Group. The Travel Leader is brought to you by The Travel Leader Coach, a leadership coaching and content company. We help established, high-performing travel leaders and teams improve leadership competencies. Learn more at www.thetravelleadercoach.com. And with that, I would like to welcome Paul to the show. Hi, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. It's awesome to have you here. Uh, we've had some contact over the last couple of years via LinkedIn and some some different forums and our shared membership with the New England Inns and Resorts Association. And I always appreciate your marketing thought leadership, uh, being a little bit of a marketing nerd myself. <laughs> And I've, I've always been drawn to you, Rachel, at these meetings. You know, I think as a younger guy, I kind of have a perception or I had a perception that owners and hospitality are kind of a monolith. But I think you've really shown, uh, you know, that there are many different types of leaders and property owners. And I've, I'm honored to know you and again, be here. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you. So by way of introduction, I love to ask my guests, what is the red thread throughout your travel and hospitality career? Yeah, you know, and I had to think a lot about that because I I, I was never really sure if I was ever going to make it in the travel industry. You know, as a kid, I was really blessed and charmed to have parents who were committed to traveling. You know, they took me and my siblings to many great places that a lot of people, you know, don't have that luxury of going to. And so my parents had always kind of told me, you know, maybe you would be interested in a career in travel and a career in hospitality. Um, unfortunately, I graduated from college in like the peak of the Great Recession. So everyone kind of my age was looking for any work that could possibly be had. Uh, and I remember for me, unfortunately, that was a job in customer service in a call center. And I was specifically working in tax preparation. And, you know, while I was doing that job for the money, what I really learned about that was I needed to find work in an industry that would where I could be a conduit to someone's happiness as opposed to a conduit to their misery in the form of taxes. <laughs> um, so I was really and I remember trying to actually get a job at hotels. You know, I've always considered myself fairly articulate, fairly good at sales, but I had applied for a couple of jobs at for front desk roles and concierge. And I remember these interviews always going really well, uh, but then the person interviewing me saying, hey, I'm sorry, I can't hire you because you don't have any hospitality experience. Uh, so eventually I, I, I became a travel agent. I think that was really my professional introduction to travel. I was helping uh, both other travel agents and direct clients, you know, book their trips to Europe, mostly uh, some of those Viking cruises. And then, you know, one day I just decided, you know, I think I'm ready to get out of this sales environment. Um, I'm lucky enough that I've traveled the world. I, I kind of know how different businesses and different cultures kind of approach travel. So that was when I decided, you know, I'm going to combine my marketing background with kind of travel. And I was lucky that Migas Hotel Group took a flyer on me. Um, I remember at an interview, they said something like, hey, Paul, we know you're going to do really good at this job. Like you can do the work. That's obvious. But we're not sure how you're going to fit into our culture. And I think the fact of the matter was I was still looking for a culture that worked for me. You know, I was pretty young in my career. Uh, and I needed a culture that prioritized people and their growth, not just as professionals, but as human beings. Uh, so I think that's something Migas Hotel Group does really well. So I'm I'm thrilled to be here, you know, and it's I'm about to hit my 10 year anniversary. That's awesome. Wow. Uh, you know, it's funny how times have changed, because if anyone said today the words, I'm really interested in hospitality, but I have no experience. It, the answer would be immediately you're hired. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're yeah. right. And I think that that was maybe some of the appeal 
two in me from my guest hotel group was, you know, it would be great to get someone with more of a corporate background, maybe not even in hospitality. Like we could use some of right. these best practices from other industries and bring it to hospitality. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it sounds like, you know, travel, it was really something that was planted, implanted in you from an early age and you were always kind of attracted to it from the sense of adding happiness to people's lives. And you've built up a number of skills that have kind of brought it all together now to be in your current position. That's fabulous. Yeah. And I remember, this is kind of a funny story. When I was in college, uh, I was kind of going through a rough patch personally, and I missed my German final. And I remember going to my professor and saying, like, you know, I totally dropped the ball on this. What can I do? And she said, you know, the, the school policy is you need to kind of talk to the school counselor and get permission to retake the final. And my the only thing I really remember from that meeting with the school counselor was them asking me what my dream job was. And I remember saying something like, you know, I would love to be working at a swanky boutique hotel on the ocean. And they okay. said, well, then what are you doing in map design? And I, I was kind of like offended when they asked me that question and I kind of blew it off. But here I am 15 years later. And, you know, that caused me to really think about where I wanted to be. Um, so yeah, it's just funny looking back on that. Yeah, no, that's a great story, which really illustrates that one, when you put something out into the universe like that, an intention that it really, things come together, but you also do kind of have to take the right steps to get you on the path to get there. Right. Um, and that was like a turning point that, that helps you do that. So wonderful. How would someone you work closely with describe you as a leader? You know, I think that a lot of my colleagues and both my friends would say that Paul is an incredibly curious person and he is always challenging the status quo. And, you know, I think there are different ways to kind of describe that. Like some people use the term disruptor or pot stirrer. You know, I think for me personally, when I think about my own approach to leadership, I, I want to find that balance between looking at the numbers and then understanding the human elements. So I, I think that a lot of my coworkers would say that Paul is very numbers driven. And, you know, I, I would agree with that. And I would agree that I'm challenging the status quo. But, you know, I don't like to stir the pot. I don't like confrontation. I don't like drama. I want to identify opportunities and use that as a space to kind of uplift the business the guests and the employees, you know, I don't like to work hard, you know, yeah. but I like to work smart. So if everything can be done in a smoother way that makes everyone's lives a bit easier, I'm going to chase that every single time. Right. Yeah. You identify such an interesting dynamic because the first words you used were disruptor and potster, which tend to have like this negative connotation to them. But your reframe is excellent because what it, what you're really driven by is seeking out opportunities, like you said. Um, and I think that's from a leadership perspective, that is, I think, what we need to be implementing more in our organizations is that it's not just to like disrupt the status quo. It's like, okay, how can we do better? Right? Right. I think that working in hospitality and with some of these properties that have, you know, really established senior members of the workforce. And when I say senior, I mean, they've just been in the same environment for a long time. Right. You know, people can be a little bit resistant to change, but when people start to welcome changes, when they realize that change is going to make their lives easier. So, right. you know, I, don't fix what ain't broke Right. and prioritize what is. Yeah. How do you think using that curiosity mindset that you, you started that discussion with, how can we as leaders help it, people in our organization make that same reframe? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that, let me, let me tell you a little story that I had over the holidays where uh, I celebrating the holiday with my nieces for the first time, they're two and four years old. 
and we were working on our gingerbread houses. And uh, my niece Hazel asked why she couldn't use spray cheese instead of frosting to kind of connect the pieces. And everyone just kind of sat there and said, well, because that doesn't really make sense. Like, why do you want cheese with your gingerbread? And she said, well, I want cheese with my gingerbread. And so where I'm going with this is like the child mindset th doesn't really think about what's possible. You know, they, they aren't worried if this is realistic or not. They just know they want to do it. And I think that that's a really good place to start. I like encourage my coworkers to forget about the barriers for a little bit and just think about that ideal situation and work backwards from there. Um, so I think that's how that's how I try and foster that amongst my coworkers. I say, forget about the obstacles and the barriers. Just think about the dream situation and work backwards from there. And I think folks are sometimes surprised that maybe that dream scenario is a little bit more realistic than they thought when they don't stress about the anxiety of those barriers. Yeah. What a wonderful metaphor. It it speaks to that idea of having a beginner's mind or, you know, a, a child's mind where when you're a child, you, you haven't been introduced yet all these messages and, and negativity like, well, you can't do that. And, and unfortunately, as we get older, we are introduced over and over to the barriers that you mentioned and the obstacles and, and we stop being able to dream about the possibilities. So yeah, it really goes back to asking uh, that question, which kind of sums up your point, which is what are the possibilities that you can ma imagine that have no barriers, for instance? Yeah, great yeah. story and a, and a wonderful leadership lesson for sure. Who are you at your core beyond titles and the roles you play? Yeah. I mean, you know, I like to just think of myself as a pretty normal, fun, loving guy. Um, like a lot of people, I, I'm pretty anxious. Um, I've been told by a lot of folks that I'm an old soul. I'm big into Elvis, for example. I'm, I'm on a super hot Elvis spree right now, which seems especially relevant because Taylor Swift has kind of just surpassed him as the greatest, I think, the chart most chart-toppingest wow. musician ever. Um, I think at the end of the day that I am really kind of a master of none, you know, both in my personal and my work life. Um, I have kind of a short attention span. Um, I guess you kind of can't see it, but I've got my guitar right here. I can play a ton of instruments, but I can't really play any of them particularly well. Um, throughout my life, I've been able to speak a couple different languages, but never more than two fluently at once. And now I can, I can only speak English. Um, so I, I feel like I have a really short attention span and there are pros and cons to that. I think the pros are that I feel like I'm getting exposed to all different things. Um, and then when I get bored of something, I just move on to something else. But I think the downside of that is, you know, sometimes you miss the detail that comes with a hobby or a passion, you know, when you really dive into it. Um, like right now, I'm actually, I talked about an Elvis kick. I'm also on kind of like a boat kick. I bought my first <laughs> boat last year um, and I bought a total clunker. I went to a YMCA auction and bought something that I wasn't even sure would run, and, but it was, it was like a project for me. If I had bought this boat and I could have never gotten it on the water, but I at least learned something like that would have been a success for me. Um, but, you know, I've been learning about electrical systems and, wow. uh, you know, how to work with fiberglass. So, so I think what I'm kind of learning about myself is that I like learning new things, but I get frustrated at a certain point and I don't have a lot of patience to wait around. <laughs> right, right. But I think where you're starting from, I mean, it relates to that point about curiosity too, right? Just an experimentation like that, you know, that's a really positive treat. And uh, yeah, I mean, being able to stick with something and really see it through is of course another important skill but i i love that you're open to all these different things it reminds me a little bit of my son like it, it started with like rubik's cubes and then it was like fishing and still is fishing luckily because of all the equipment he's got but um i think that 
that whole process of finding where you get joy um, is part of life and, uh, you know, is the lighter side of things. So thank you for sharing. And I think that, you know, what joy looks like kind of changes as you age, Uh you know, Um, I, I think that a couple of years ago, people would have called me kind of a party guy. Um, I don't think I would have, but I'm certainly not anymore. You know, I'm, I'm a homebody tinkering in my basement with tools. Um, but who knows what joy will look like for me a couple of years from now. Yeah. You, you also mentioned when you started that, uh, answering that question about the fun part of it and what, how do you bring fun into the workplace and the people that that you work with? That's a really good question. You know, I, I like to, maybe it's just by not really being serious all the time and not taking myself too seriously. Oh, um, yeah. You know, I know that memes are kind of a hot thing. I love sharing work specific memes with my coworkers about a specific project we may be going through. And, you know, just not taking everything so seriously. I think that's yeah. it for me. Um, I was planning on talking about this a little bit later. One of my favorite things to do when I meet a new coworker is tell them everything I've messed up at, Uh, like in regard to the job, partly because I kind of want to put them at ease. Um, but just, you know, and most of these are like funny stories, you know, it's not like I accidentally got a guest killed or something, but it's, it's, you know, maybe I didn't, uh, articulate myself as effectively as I would have liked. And maybe there's a funny anecdote from that. So, you know, if you're not really having fun in the workplace, find another job. Yeah. And if you're, well, if you're making a bunch of money, then maybe it's okay. But, you know, for me, it's about that balance. Yeah. Well, we spend so much of our lives at work. That fun element is important. And I think, yeah, also to your point of not taking things too, or not taking yourself too seriously. Yeah. Uh, Because, and having that kind of perspective of relativism you know, like, what are we really talking about here? You know, are we saving lives? Probably not. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, it's a balance between having a strong purpose and working towards that purpose versus like, hey, like, this is not the end of the world. If it doesn't always go perfectly, for sure. Agreed. Yeah. What are your unique strengths or qualities? So I wanted to start answering this question by telling you what I think my weakness is, which is I'm opinionated and I like to talk. And what I've kind of learned about myself over the last couple of years is that I was historically not a very good listener. And I actually had this huge epiphany about it again, kind of over a holiday get together when I, I realized that I interrupted my mom all the time. And she's a lot like me, very opinionated, uh, likes to talk. And that I would never interrupt my dad. But my dad is also very quiet and a man of few words. But when he speaks, it's really relevant. And, you know, like he can, what he can say in a sentence might take other people, you know, half an hour to get through. So what I think is becoming a strength for me is that I'm becoming a better listener. You know, I... I think I've realized that, you know, what's going on in my head is not always quite as important as what I can hear from others. Uh, And there's a lot that can be digested from folks. And what I've especially learned is the quieter someone is, usually the more meaningful what they have to say is. Um, So I don't know if I would say that's a strength for me right now, but it's something I'm trying to get better at. And I I think I'm learning a lot of valuable lessons from, you know, people talk about how COVID has changed personalities. I think before COVID, I was like, without a doubt, an extrovert talking all the time, going out all the Mm -hmm. time, trying to meet new people. Um, As a result of COVID, I think I've become more of an introvert, which has allowed me to just listen more. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. Um, I I have described my own development in that way recently as well. And, you know, I think what you you demonstrate, too, is that our our strengths, they're built up over time and through an evolutionary process. It's not like something that we're just born with. I mean, some people are born with some unique 
you know, innate talents, but these are things that we learn from experiences. And, you know, what's kind of an uh, underlying theme that I'm hearing from your stories too, is the amount of self-reflection that you are doing in your own thought, you know, thought process and development and learning from that reflection process that you're doing. And also thinking about, okay, well, I'm not really happy with, or I'm not really satisfied with being this person. I want to be this type of person. Um, and that is a really self-awareness, self-reflection is the absolute number one skill of a leader. Um, and, and modeling that behavior for others is also critical. So kudos for that, for sure. What stories or experiences have shaped who you are today? So, you know, I talked about kind of the benefits of being able to see the world from a young age. And, you know, when I say the world, I, I mean different parts of the world physically, like going to Europe, for example, but also kind of seeing different neighborhoods in my local area. You know, like I grew up in central Massachusetts, kind of straddling where the very wealthy meet the not very wealthy. Um, so just kind of being able to absorb different worldviews and different lifestyles, I think has really shaped me a lot. And I think that one experience that totally shaped me was when I was in college, my parents kind of pushed me and my siblings to all study abroad. And, uh, my sister went to Italy or sorry, she went to the UK. My brother wanted to go to Italy or Hungary. And I remember telling my parents, like, I think I want to go somewhere in the Middle East which they were kind of afraid of uh, because the, you know, Iraq war was still going on and everything, but I managed to talk my parents um, into letting me go to Turkey. And a big reason I wanted to do that was I wanted to go somewhere where I, I couldn't speak the language and people didn't really speak English a whole lot. So I thought, well, I can speak some German. I can obviously speak English, but I, you know, I went there without speaking a word of Turkish and you know, just seeing this like totally different worldview was really powerful for me. And I remember like one classic example I can think of, I had actually kind of like gotten in a bit of trouble at a bar, uh, which led to me kind of getting out of there. And I had a rental car and I was, I was driving home, so, like an eight-year-old kid, first of all, it's like two in the morning. So this was a little weird, but an eight-year-old kid like runs out in the middle of the road, like to stop me. And I'm like, what's going on? I had like lost a hubcap from the rental car, you know, that had fallen off just like that piece of plastic. And yeah. he had like ran down the road to give it back to me. Ugh. And I was like, okay, cool. And uh, again, I didn't speak English very, or sorry, I didn't speak Turkish very well at that time. And the kid gets in the car with me at like two in the morning. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is so weird. First of all, you know, in the U S as a kid, we're told never get in a car with a stranger. This kid like willingly hopped in and I'm like, what do I do? Do I kick this kid out of the car? Like, I feel like I can't really do that after he just did me this favor. And long story short, he wound up taking me back to his house where his brother like invited me in. And I wound up like staying with this family for three days just because oh of gosh. this like freak encounter. Um, and, you know, I think that really taught me to, again, not get too much in my head and assume what's going to happen. You know, just kind of right. go with the flow a little bit. And, you know, when you go with the flow, like you got to take the good with the bad and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, but I would rather live in a, a dynamic life than kind of a boring, consistent life. Yeah. Well, what it seems like is there's this underlying a sense of adventure and like being open to unexpected experiences. Um. What is it about that, that, what are you, what makes you driven for that? Maybe, maybe it's just boredom. You know, I, I can't really think of like a better answer. Uh, but I, I'm just not very good at sitting still, you know? Yeah. And I think I, my point about being a master of none and always picking up new hobbies and dropping them, I think is kind of a good example of that. Um, so 
I think it's, and it sounds cliche, but I think maybe my own entertainment is my biggest driver and dictates how I'm going to react to a situation. Right, right. And there's, I mean, there, and there was a lesson learned from that experience too. I mean, what, what was that for you? I think it was to be comfortable, more comfortable with uncertainty. You know, I, I think that growing up, I lived this very charmed life where bad things didn't really happen all that often. Um, And as I was becoming an adult, that comfort zone was like an attractive place to go back to. But then I kind of remember that I was kind of bored as a kid, you know, all of that comfort can be kind of boring. And my brother likes to talk a lot about how he wishes that he had grown up in a a more troubled area because, you know, when we think about some of the world's greatest artists or personalities, like they're people who grew up in very difficult circumstances. And so I think my, my brother is like, well, maybe if I had had that tough upbringing, I could have been a more dynamic person. And what I like to think is, you know, just seek out more dynamic experiences and maybe that will come anyways. You know, there's no going. Yes. Um, so instead of being frustrated that something didn't go a certain way, you know, try and pivot to go down that path you want to go down. Yeah. Well, a hundred percent. I mean, the growth comes from hardship or as you point out, stretching your comfort, stretching yourself out of your comfort zone. And that is, and you learn things from it and you become more resilient for sure. So, you know, I've, I've read similar statistics too about, um, you know, different groups of people and how hardships have really shaped their success. And no, I mean, we don't wish anyone to grow up under really dire circumstances. So yeah. How do you recreate that? Well, you, you are, you know, sort of artificially created by creating and doing things that are hard <laughs> right and and different <laughs> for sure yeah can you describe a time when you felt most alive or fulfilled i would love to and this kind of again goes back to my time in the middle east uh i had told my so i was studying abroad in istanbul you know big modern massive modern city And as I was kind of getting towards the end of the program, I told myself, I want to travel somewhere else in Turkey or the Middle East that's kind of off the beaten path because I want to practice my Turkish. That was kind of my real goal. And so I talked to a lot of my Turkish friends and I was like telling them I wanted to go to this region near the Syrian border or near the Iranian border. And they said something like that would be like if we came to the U.S. and said we wanted to go to Mississippi which I thought was kind of funny. Um, So I did decide to do that. And I had some good experiences and some bad experiences just by nature of being in a place where not a lot of white people go um, who don't speak the language. But so where I'm going with this is I was crossing uh, the Iraqi border into back into Turkey from Iraq in a taxi. And it was just me and this taxi driver And this taxi driver had snuck a bunch of illegal cigarettes and other contraband into my bags, which the Turkish police found. Um, And of course, they were accusing, everyone was kind of accusing me. And I had to defend myself in Turkish, which I was like, not speaking very fluently. And I actually was. And I remember the, the border guard, the Turkish guard was saying like, you know, you reek of cigarettes. You you clearly smoke cigarettes. You obviously brought these back. I did smoke cigarettes at the time, but I smoked a very specific brand that you could actually only get in the U.S. or at the airport. So that was how I defended myself to this border guard. I said, well, actually, this is my brand of cigarettes. And you can see all these ones this guy is trying to bring over are like these really disgusting, cheap ones. So long story short, I managed to convince this guy that I had nothing to do with this and they let me go. And the reason I think I felt most alive in that moment was a, I had kind of underestimated my own ability to communicate and defend myself. Uh, But it was just, you know, you get such a high after something like that, like that crazy adrenaline rush. 
And, you know, I was only out in that part of Turkey and on that border for like another week. But I was like, you know what, I'm going to I'm really going to keep taking some more risks here. Like, what's the worst that could possibly happen? And <laughs> and that led to me having more interesting experiences, not all good again, but things that, you know, really shape who I am today, I think. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's like a made, you know, made for a movie story. <laughs> They've had movies about that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just for clarification, it wasn't like I was arrested and I was being inter interrogated no. and everything. But, you know, there are a bunch of men with like big guns around and, you know, I'm wow. this little white kid clearly out of place. So, yeah, I, I, I just felt so alive because I was being successful in a new place where I never envisioned myself being successful before. Yeah. Well, and, and under pressure, what you were, what you're able to do. And like you said, you're using your language skills and, um, you know, kind of surprising yourself at your ability to get out of that very difficult situation. And I think the pressure piece is important too. Yeah. I, I think after that, I started to feel a lot more confident in myself and realize that I was capable of handling these stressful moments and everything would turn out fine, you know? So I, yeah. I, I still think about that when I'm facing a situation that maybe seems like there's a low chance of success. Back to, you know, think about the best possible outcome. Don't be stressed about what could go wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that relates to one of my other questions about underestimating yourself. Um, that in that situation that you, you were kind of doing that, you know, and you just described kind of a strategy for raising your confidence in those situations, which is, it, I think what you're referring to is to, oh, when, um, to think about times when you've overcome the adversity and like, oh, I can do this. You know, I've done it before. I can do it now in this new situation. Right. For sure. Yeah. Did you have any other experiences you wanted to talk about where you underestimated yourself? Well, you know, I honestly, I feel like I, I'm constantly underestimating myself. I, and I know a lot of my friends and, are kind of the same way. I just finished mm -hmm. a grad school program that throughout the entire time I was like totally stressed out, um, doing homework assignments like weeks in advance because just the anxiety of thinking about having to do them was really stressing me out. Um, and I, I really felt like I was suffering from imposter syndrome. And mm -hmm. I've kind of always felt that in my workplace as well. Um, but I think I had some good news like I found that when I start to feel imposter syndrome is when I think I'm actually on the right path and like actually know what I'm talking about and what I'm doing. Um, so it's, it sounds so weird, but whenever I, when, I, when I start to feel like I'm having imposter syndrome and something I'm doing, that's when I like know that I'm actually kind of on the right path as opposed to being confident in something that I don't know if I should be confident about yet, you know? Right. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. So what makes, what, how do you, how does that connection happen to you? Like, I mean, you've, it's now become a signal for you. Where, where, do, how does that happen? I don't know. I think it's just when you start to get the lay of the land around a process or a skill you're trying to learn, you know, like at the beginning, doing something can either feel really overwhelming or really simple. And odds right. are you're probably uh, either overestimating it opposite of what the situation actually is. If it's if you think it's really easy, it's probably really complicated. And then when you get to that point of understanding how complicated it is, you only know that because of what you've digested oh. about that process. Like right. playing instruments, I think, is a great example. I, I am like a guitar player. I've been wanting to learn how to play the banjo. And at first I thought it was going to be like very easy being like, you know, this is kind of the same. How different is, how different is a banjo from a guitar was what I thought initially. But as I actually got better, I was like, oh, wow, playing a banjo is like totally different from a guitar. And there are different types of banjos. 
And that's when I could look and say, well, I only think that this is complicated because I know so much about it, you know? Right. And so you now at that point know more than you think you know. And so, yeah, and probably you know a lot more than the average person. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and so that, that confidence yeah. that comes maybe at the beginning when you're like, oh, this is easy. It's because you just don't know the unknown unknowns yet. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, that's very fascinating. Uh, the way our brain like makes trips you know, these tricks on us, um, is very interesting. <laughs> so going back to another question I had is what do you stand for no matter what? You know, this, this is probably going to sound pretty cliche, but for me, I think it is just our humanity as individuals and as employees, as workers, you know, early in my career, I, I felt like a total drone. You know, and I was treated like a drone. My bosses were drones treated by like a drone by their bosses, who was then, you know, just like an endless cycle of work and stress. And, yeah. you know, in the workplace, I, I want to be seen as a human being first before anything else. Yeah. Um, I talked about how when I meet new employees, I kind of like to break the ice by telling them about a time I totally messed up. Um because I want to put them at ease and I want them to know that failure is part of learning. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're at our best when we're honest with ourselves and our contemporaries about who we are and how we work and how we don't work. Um, so the last thing I would want my coworkers or my bosses to think about me is that I'm perfect. You know, I'm a human being just like everyone else. Um, and I wouldn't be who I am today if I hadn't made those mistakes that show right. that I'm not perfect, you know? So yeah. I, I think that above all else is just remembering that everyone you work with is a human being with the family and people they love and lives yeah. outside of work. And, and that's why I'll never work in a startup. Yeah. <laughs> You're, it, uh, I'm ha what's the connection to the, to the startup? It's just, you know, I, I, I have friends who have worked for startups and, and I guess I was really kind of envisioning like the stereotypical, like tech startup, but right. a job that pretty much asks you to sacrifice your humanity to do this job. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. From right. And, and base, yeah, basically just commit your entire life to the vision of, right. of the, the, the company. Yeah. And I mean, that can go beyond a startup too. Um, oh, great. For sure. But I, I could see how you, the association is made with startup companies for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, it, you, I mean, what I'm understanding is your definition of, of hum standing for humanity is that realizing that we are all imperfect beings and we, we come with both good and and you know, strengths and weaknesses and seeing people as a whole person um is what's really important exactly exactly yeah yeah what impact do you strive to have in the travel industry you know i feel like the hospitality industry specifically like being up here in maine uh it has this reputation of being a job that is incredibly hard uh, demeaning at times, and you're not paid very well for it. You know, I, I think that's the perception of the industry. I think there are certain elements of that that are true. Um, I think there are some elements of it that are a little overhyped. Um, but I want to bring the fun back into this industry, especially for the workers, you know. Uh, and I think I'll just leave it at that. You know, I've, yeah. I've always kind of loved this idea of Xenia, which is, you know, this premise that I, my understanding is it's like an ancient Greek term that means like something about unconditional hospitality. You would take in your high school bully if they showed up at your door on a rainy night when they've got nowhere else to go. Um, so just kind of bringing hospitality back to being a place that is associated with good vibes, you yeah. know? Yeah. 
for and I mean, especially since that's what we do for our guests, right? I mean, we want to create a similar, you know, a similar but different type of environment for the people that work in it as well. Right. I, it seems like a mistake to expect employees to deliver a great experience to a guest when, you know, they are totally tied up with the stresses of that work. You know, like Mingus Hotel Group, we, I don't know if we came up with this phrase, I doubt it. I bet it's been used all over the place. But, you know, when an employee is taken care of, that's when they can actually take care of a guest. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that's, that is a, um, I love that mantra, um, which, it, you know, I've heard from uh, the the older Bill Marriott um, talks, you know, he has a quote like that, or Richard Branson from Virgin, uh, he has a quote that is very similar to that. And, and I very personally ascribe to that all the time, uh, for sure. What leadership skill do you most rely on to lead people and teams? Um, for me, it's definitely going to be accountability. I think that whether you are a big organization or a small organization, when folks don't really know the rules of engagement, you're going to find yourself in situations where you can't really understand why something you've tried to do worked or didn't, you know, mm. and that can be very frustrating. And it's, you know, it's not really about punishing people who have failed or rewarding people who have done well. It's about like everyone knowing their role and knowing how to work together to be greater than the sum yeah. of their parts. And I think accountability is like the most important piece to that. And back to this idea of me telling folks when I've messed up, you know, I, I think that an, a leader has to be vulnerable in that regard. And so I would say that that accountability is kind of my, my big one, but then vulnerability is kind of the side piece that has to come with accountability. Uh, because again, no one is perfect in everything that they do. Right. So right. And it's like almost, it's a little bit, it's a balance between those for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, what, what you're also saying, it sounds like is that, um, you know, it's also setting clear roles and expectations so that everybody, you know, is set up for success in the first place as much right. as possible. I have been, I've worked for many businesses over the years where there has been such a crazy spectrum of people's perceptions of how the business is actually doing. And I think that is like a really scary place to be where some people think that the business or the organization or the company is doing amazing when it's actually not or vice versa. You know, everyone kind of needs to be on the same page as to how they are working together, what's working and what's not. And so I would say like, if within your organization, there is a wide spectrum of people's perceptions of how you're doing, uh, that is a problem that should be rectified immediately. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So before we finish up today, uh, I, you know, we were talking earlier about dreaming without barriers. This, uh, this question definitely uh, hones in on that. What vision would you pursue if you had everything you needed to succeed right now? So I would start by admitting that I am very risk adverse in my personal life. Whereas like in the workplace, I'm willing to take calculated risks and encourage people to do so. Like in my personal life, I'm like not that willing. You know, I'm, I'm kind of conservative in my decision making. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I have always loved bowling. And <laughs> I know that you guys. Yes have your own bowling alley, which actually I went to a couple of years ago. Um, but I'm a Candlepin guy because I'm from central yeah. Massachusetts. We're like the home yes, of Candlepin. Yes, very big in Mass. And it's, it's fairly big here in certain parts of Maine. And there are a couple bowling alleys around here that I love, you know, oh. like, because they are kind of more of that old school vibe. Like you can still smell the cigarettes in the shag yeah. carpeting and they're still <laughs> using like this ancient equipment uh which brings some nostalgia and is pretty cool but then they do things like maybe serve an, a frozen elio's pizza as their only food 
you know? Yeah. Um, so I am really hoping that I can get to a place where I'm willing to kind of pull the trigger and try and create my own hospitality experience as oh. opposed to delivering one, you know, through my employer. I would love to buy an old bowling alley and c turn it into a community hub that I know it could be. Uh, what I like about bowling is I think it's a place where generations can really come together, you know? Yes. Because you see little kids bowling, you see old men bowling and ev everyone in yeah. between. Um, so if I had everything I needed to succeed right now, which I, which I'm probably kind of thinking of like financial resources, right. That, right. that is what I would go out and do. Yeah. Oh, you just so tugged on my heartstrings, Paul. I love that. That's amazing. So for our listeners, yes, my family owns an eight lane boutique bowling lounge in Stowe, Vermont. And, um, you know, we built it from scratch, you know, based on a lot what Paul just said was creating a hospitality experience around a very nostalgic and old school tradition in America. And um, yeah, well, if you ever want to connect and hear about our, like our failures <laughs> and, and what brought us to be able to bring that to fruition, um, I'd love to connect with you on that. That's awesome. I absolutely love that. And I've been to, have you been to the one in Rangeley? I have not. But I think I know which yeah. is that a ten pin or is that a candle pin? That's a ten pin. Yeah. 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 But um, they, you know, they've kind of done some different upgrades there. I think it's called Moose Alley. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure if there's any other in Maine that have done like a, a total transformation. The uh, biggest one. Process. Are you familiar with Bayside Bowl in Portland? Oh no, no! I'll have to I, check that out. I think that's a great example. My understanding is that it was kind of like an institution, a bowling institution in that area. And then they they really did a big renovation just kind of to bring it up to contemporary expectations for not just yeah. bowling, but a good time. Um, like they right. have, you know, this bowling alley I'm tell telling you about that I would love to buy, you know, the bar space is like 3% of their floor. Bayside right. Bowl, I would say half of their space is dedicated to food and drink. They have like yeah. this really cool rooftop deck. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely some people bringing bowling into the 21st century. Yeah, that's awesome. Great. Well, we'll for sure connect more and more on that. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure talking with you today, Paul. I've enjoyed our conversation. And until next time, I'm Rachel Vandenberg, and this is the Travel Leader Podcast.